We're going through this series right now, Unleash the Lion, and this this whole concept that what would it look like in 2018 if we as a church really took the leashes that we we prefer to keep on God to keep him somewhat controlled and tame in our life? What if we were to unleash him and just let him move through our life? And two weeks ago, Josh started us off talking about what begins to happen is God begins to create what what we need is a white-hot faith for him, a passionate uh, connection to God and a loving relationship. Last week, Josh talked about then it begins to to have a commitment to the cause and walk through what that looks like throughout so many people's relationships in the Bible. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like to have contagious relationships. But the whole concept for me is kind of mind blowing of, of the idea that we keep God like on a leash. And we might not think about it that way, but we really do. And I think some of it is because like, I don't know if we're honest and I'll just be honest about myself. I'm not sure that I always trust God. Like He's big. Sometimes you think he's scary. You're not sure about it. And it's like, you know what, God, if you could just stay on a leash and just maybe be a good little kitty next to me, right? Like, don't go go crazy. Don't go leading me anywhere weird. Please no roaring, you know, especially around my work friends, because that would be odd. You know, I mean, I'm not sure I want them to know that, that you're in my life that much. Just kind of be cool if you would. And, and I think about like the idea of the leash. I was thinking about dogs this week. We have a dog named Theo. He's an interesting dog. He's a, he's a mini golden doodle, just basically looks like a big fuzzball of curls and, and like a teddy bear. And, and it's interesting with Theo is I feel bad. I was talking to a neighbor last night and she said that she takes her dog on a walk every day, even in the snow. And she was explaining to me about how, how sad she is when she has to like trudge through people's, you know, sidewalks that aren't, pla- like aren't, you know, shoveled. And I thought, that's my sidewalk. And then I thought to myself, like, you are such a better dog owner than I, because basically once it got like below zero, like I just had to look at Theo and be like, look, bro, it's not going to be till like April that we're doing walks. All right. Because I don't want to be outside. You don't need to walk that bad. But hey, there's different kinds of leashes, too. Right. I've got the kind of the, the kind you get when you train him with like the, the little leather thing. And then sometimes you can get like the retractable one where your dog thinks they have extra freedom because you let them out and then you can pull them back. And then, but there's some of us, right, that we, how many people are a strict, you're an outside dog person? Any outside dog people? Anybody? Okay, well, pray for your soul, because you got to be an inside dog person, right? But but I know there's some dogs that are supposed to be outside dogs, and we have an outside dog, and I get it, right? You put your dog outside, and it's kind of like, listen, dog, you're a dog, you're not a human, you're going to live outside in the backyard, and we might even get you one of those leashes, you know, like the corkscrew ones that go in and they get like a 50 foot thing where they can just run in a circle like crazy. And sometimes your dog forgets that they have that and they start chasing a bunny or something and they get out to the end of that 25 foot and they almost decapitate themselves, right? But you got your dog in your backyard and sometimes it's like, listen, dog, you're not coming inside our house. Like you're going to live in that backyard. Here's what we need you to do, dog. Dog, I need you to hang out in the backyard and protect our house from like dangerous stuff and strangers, so if dog, if you could live out in the backyard, in fact, you know what, dog, I'll even give you your own house. Like we'll put a sign on that says like the house of dog. And like we might even make it nice. And you just listen, dog, you live in your house in your backyard and I'll live in my house. And sometimes we'll hang out maybe on the weekends in the backyard, but you stay in your house because you're not going to come in my house, dog. Because if you come in my house, I tell you what you're not doing, dog. You're not going to sit on the couch with me, dog, and we're not going to be really close. And like, we're not going to be there when I'm watching TV or whatever I want to just get into, whether it's comp- on my computer or whatever, my leisure time, you know, dog, you're not going to hang out on the couch with me, dog. And I'll tell you what else you're not going to do, dog. No sleeping in my bed. How many have dogs that sleep in their bed with them, right? Dogs are crazy. Our dog, Theo, literally sleeps behind my head. And in the mornings, he will come and stand on my chest and stare at me like, what do you think, maybe we should get up right now? And I'm thinking, I am going to get up now because you're suffocating me because you're standing on my chest. But some of you guys, say, I'm going to have a dog outside. Dog, you're not coming in my bed, right? Because what goes on in my room and in my bedroom, I don't need a dog a part of what goes on in my bedroom. Like I'm a single adult, you know what I mean? I'm heading to Broad Ripple after church and I don't need a dog in my bedroom getting in my way when I'm doing bedroom stuff, dog, right? And I'm surely not taking my dog like to work or on vacation, I mean, have you seen the people sometimes that take their dogs places and like, have you seen the dog strollers? If you have a dog stroller, you're psycho. All right. I just want to let you know right now. All right. And if you ever been to the airport and they see the people that have the dog little carry on, right? They're just like, I got him in here. And they're taking the dog on trips, right? These people are crazies. 
They have lost their mind with their love for this dog. It goes everywhere with them. It's in the bedroom with them. It's on the couch with them. It's all over their house. They even let their friends know them. They take it to friends' houses. And then I was thinking about unleash the lion, and I thought, you know what? We just take that word dog, and we rearrange the word, the letters a little bit, and we get the word God. And I thought, that's me sometimes. Hey, God, here's the deal. Just stay in the backyard. Protect my family from anything bad to happen, right? Alert me if there's danger, but just stay in your house. You got a lot of them around town. I drive past them all the time. It's like six of them on Oleo Road by our house. It's like Oleo Road. It's all these churches, right? It's like, God, you stay in your house. And listen, God, I'm not sure I want you in real close to me on the couch. And I'm not sure that I want you in my bedroom. And please don't go to work with me. And when I go on vacation, God, can I just go on vacation and you can just stay home? But maybe that's just me. But actually, you know what? I, I know it's not because... I, I live life with many of you and I talk to you and it's just human nature. That, that's almost exactly the way we treat God. Because God is, is, is really good, but he's not real safe, is he, right? To borrow a line from the Chronicles of Narnia from C.S. Lewis. Like, and if he's God, if he really is, and he's not a, just a lion, I mean, we're borrowing this phrase from a couple of scriptures throughout where he's known as the Lion of Judah, but if he is God that created and sustained the whole universe, if he's the God that created you for a purpose and on a purpose, if he's, if he's the God that is all powerful and all holy and almighty God, it is just kind of ridiculous that we treat him like a dog. And when we do, what we miss out on is the life that he created us to live. So what I want to invite us in today is what, what if we were to consider taking him off the leash and see where he would run. My dog, Theo, if you let him out the gate, I tell you where he runs. He runs out our backyard as fast as he can go and he runs around the neighborhood to all the different neighborhood dogs to say hi to them and pee on their fence. That's what he does. We used to chase him thinking he's gonna not come back and now I don't even like to chase him because I just know he's gonna just take this little circuit, he's gonna pee on everybody's fence and then he'll meet me back in the cul-de-sac like, all right, just had to say what's up to the bros, right? I don't know what's going on in his dog brain. but. Where is God going to go if I take him off the leash? And I think he's going to do a lot of things. But tonight, what I want us to consider is I think God's going to do three things if you take him off the leash. I think God's going to change the purpose of your life. I think God's going to change the purpose of your life from conditional love and separation or, 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 or space or distance. He's going to change your, your, your purpose of your life to unconditional love and connection. We're going to unpack that real quick. I think God is also, I think God's going to change his proximity to you if you let him off the, off the leash. And I think when he changes his proximity to you, I think what he's going to do is he's going to move to the places in your life that contain the most fear and pain. Not to be scary or to be mean, but I think he's going to go there because if he can replace your fear and pain with unconditional love and connection, your life will begin to be lived with so much more joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. And then I think the third thing he's going to do is he's going to change your posture towards the world around you. Jesus, as we spend these next few minutes together, I just pray that you would speak to us. pray that you'd give me your words for your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God's going to change your purpose. And the reason he's going to change your purpose, if you let him off the leash, is because he actually wants to make your life shaped and formed around unconditional love and connection with other people. It's kind of his whole deal, if you stop and think about it. Like, what is the message of the entire Bible, if we could boil it down to, to two things? The entire message of the whole Bible is unconditional love and connection. God is unconditionally loving towards us and he has stopped at nothing, even giving his own life to stay connected with us. So if we unleash him in our life and he says, listen, I'm going to try to make you like me because you are created in my image. It's no surprise that he would say the purpose of your life is now going to be unconditional love and connection. And I think that is a very contagious way to live. Like 
If you think about the person in your life that currently lives with the most unconditional love and connection, for some reason you're drawn to want to be with them regularly. You may have even married them. They may be your mom or your dad. When you get around somebody that, that, that is, is unconditionally loving and, and, and stops at nothing to stay connected to you in relationship, it's very, very contagious. And here's, here's the thing I want you to realize about your life is this, is you are contagious. You are contagious. Right now, contagious is, is a big word because how many of you have had the flu, some get close to your life in the past like month and a half? Anybody flu close to your life? Yeah, it infected our house this week, all right? The flu hit the early wine house this week, and I don't know about you guys, but when, when in our house... When, when something contagious moves into our house, it's full, it's, it's code red, it's a lockdown, all right? If somebody has a stomach flu in our house, the moment they throw up, my wife is there with the jug of bleach, and it's like the throw up hits it, you flush it, boom, you hit it with the bleach, all right? Everything's bleached down, that child is put in a straight jacket and tied to their bed. They're not getting out. Quarantine. No one touches them, we forget, we, we, don't, even, we don't even speak their name till the vomit has stopped, all right? This week it was the flu. And I've had the flu twice in the past 10 years. And those were the worst eight days of my life in the past 10 years. I hate the flu. So this week when the flu came into our house, it was shut down. Put our son Cole in the basement. We just threw down Cheez-Its to him every 15 minutes. You can survive off this. Let us know when you're done, all right? But we did everything so we wouldn't catch the flu. We, we called a homeopathic friend and Julie went and got some kind of berry juice that I don't even know what country it's from. And everybody's taking shots of some crazy berry juice stuff at our house, all right? I can't even pronounce what it is. I got to talk to boys in every morning. Like, can I take my juice, Dad? Yeah, we all have to take the juice, son, right? <laughs> we don't want the flu. Take it. Explain to him how to like, I'm trying to talk, talk to my seven-year-old now. It's like, you take it and you got to chase it down with your toast. Put a lot of jelly on there. You won't notice the taste, right? <laughs> Everything we can do because no one wants to catch the flu because the flu is in our house. And it got me thinking about my life and our lives. You see, your life, you are contagious, when people spend a significant amount of time with you, they catch what you're infected with. You see, that's why when you unleash the lion of Judah, when you unleash Jesus in your life, what he wants to do is change your purpose so that what you're infected with is his love. So the purpose of your life becomes unconditional love and connection. So when people spend significant amount of time with you, what they begin to catch is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. I got a question for you. Right now, if someone spent a significant amount of time in your household, in six months, what would they be infected with? No, I never really thought about that much. Well, see, if, if the purpose of your life is an unconditional love and connection, what might be happening and what actually is happening, because we're all flawed and messed up and broken and we're trying to work our way back into the way that Jesus created us, is that usually deep down inside we're motivated by fear. It's, it's our number one motivator. And the fear drives us to keep people at enough of a distance that we still feel safe. And then we have coping me mechanisms and things that we do to control the people in our life to make sure we still feel safe and we don't have to deal that much with the fear in our life that maybe we would be rejected or maybe that we're not enough or maybe that they would leave us or maybe that they're not going to do what we want. This fear begins to control us. And then we begin to manipulate the people around us. And sometimes it looks like good manipulation where we, we do all the right stuff to try to get them to do what we want them to do. But see, the people that spend the most amount of time around us, they're catching whatever virus we're infected with. And I think for me, and I think for you, 
is like our kids, right? They spend 18 years basically with us. I guess the national stats are that it's more like 26 years now or something. Lord have mercy. It's going to be 18 at our house. I just want you to know, boys, we will change the locks. Um, I'm just kidding, sort of. Um, But have you ever heard the phrase like the apple never falls far from the tree? Sometimes, none of you, this doesn't apply to any of you, but have you ever met a kid and after like 15 minutes or 15 hours with them, you think, I can't stand that kid. Like you met a kid and you're like, that kid is really a jerk. Or you meet a kid and you're like, that kid is the most like entitled, spoiled, like something is wrong with this kid. And you think to yourself, how did they get infected with that problem? And then you spend 15 minutes with their mom or dad, right? And you realize, wait a second, you're just like your parents. And that's what's happening to us. I want you guys to to know, okay? So if I'm not motivated, and Jesus hasn't changed my heart to be motivated to live with unconditional love and connection to people, my kids are catching that. It's what is, it's, it's, it's how I'm contagious in my life. And I think for all of us, we'd like to get to the end of our life and look back at our, at our kids and our grandkids and our great, great grandkids and have them look back at our life and say, you know what I caught from grandma? You know what I caught from being around grandpa? Is they lived with unconditional love and they would do everything to stay connected. And that was because Jesus had changed the purpose of their lives. When that happens, we, we become contagious and, and, and then the spread of God's love then actually will, will change the world. It'll start in your world, but then it'll actually bubble out to change the whole world. And that's the whole spread of Christianity. This thing that we're talking about today, because 2,018 years ago, a man named Jesus, who was a son of God, lived for, for, for 33 years, he lived a perfect and sinless life, and then he died for the sins of the world, and then three days later, he came back from the dead to see and prove that unconditional love could not be defeated and reconnect with humanity. That has continued on and spread around the globe for over 2,000 years, and now I'm talking about it to you today. And now you're alive and you will live your life and make certain decisions and, and, and whether you keep God in the backyard and his own little house or he doesn't come in your house, whatever it is. But if you will unleash the power of God in your life, you will join in with this mission that has been going for 2,000 years and you will begin to see God's love, which is full of, of virtue, which is full of honesty, which is full of, which is full of faith and hope and love and, 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 and honor and self-control and gentleness and peace and patience, all these things that I think all of us would go, I want that in my life. I want that in the legacy of my family. Well, see, that's found as you actually unleash the love of God in your life. He changes your purpose. And that's what you operate under. Here's how it spreads. Check this out. This is really, really cool to watch, the spread of Christianity. Let me take you. Anybody woke up this morning and thought, you know what I need in my life? A little more church history. Well, have I got a deal for you, all right? So Christianity, according to Steve Addison in his book, uh, Movements That Changed the World, which some of our outposts are reading, he says this, Christianity spread. Its spread was fast and spontaneous. It had happened without a centralized coordinating organization. Never has any social, religious, or political movement achieved such rapid advance in a dominant culture without the aid of military force. Christianity ultimately conquered the Roman world without an organized structure, without access to significant resources, without academic institutions, without professionalized clergy. Ordinary people on fire with the love of Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit simply told their families, friends, and casual acquaintances what God had done for them. They just the purpose of their life changed. They began to live for unconditional love and connection. And then they just began to tell the people in close proximity what Jesus was doing for them. They observed that their life were actually different and the spread of Christianity took off. Here's how it goes. It starts off right about 30 AD, seven weeks after the death of Jesus and his resurrection. There's about 120 disciples. 
The day of Pentecost happens, and it sounds like this in Acts 2. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were, they were all together, about 120 of them, right, in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from, and it filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread. He spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different tongues and languages as the Spirit prompted them. They left that room. They began to preach to the people in Jerusalem, and over 3,000 people caught the virus of God's unconditional love, and it once again began to spread. Let's skip forward just about 30 years, 66 AD. Now we've grown to around 40 thousand people that are infected with the virus of unconditional love and connection and it goes like this and with that the apostles were on their way continuing to witness and spread the message of God's salvation preaching in every Samaritan town as they passed through on the return to Jerusalem then we continue on we move forward to the end of the first century and now we've gone from 120 to 3,000 to 40,000 and now we have between 100 and 125,000 people infected with the virus of God's unconditional love and connection. And it goes like this, moving on to Acts 13, when the non-Jewish, when the non-Jewish outsiders heard this, that they were actually included in on God's love, they could hardly believe their good fortune. All who were marked out for real life put their trust in God. They honored God's word by receiving that life in this message of salvation spread like wildfire throughout the region. By the time we get up to about 300 AD, we have over 6 million people infected with the virus of God's unconditional love and connection. And from that point on, it just keeps spreading from household to household to household as people unleash the line of God in their life and he changes their purpose and then he begins to change their proximity to himself. Now, here's the deal. If you're not contagious with the love of God right now, you say, you know what, if I look at my life, I don't know that anybody's caught that from me before. That's okay. Some of you may be here and you're like, I just came to check out church and now I'm kind of freaked out because I don't want a virus or whatever you freaky people have. I just came to church on Saturday night, okay? I am speaking you know, metaphorically, there isn't actually a virus, but there is actually the spirit of God that will change your purpose. And God does actually wanna change his proximity to your life and become very closely associated with your life. But some of you just, you just haven't been around Jesus that much. And so, you know, it's like, I don't really have a, I'm not really contaminated with that, I guess. And, and that's a proximity issue. You just haven't been around it much. Some of us, We've been around it a lot. We're just really meh about it. We're just kind of lukewarm about it. We just kind of have God, have, have God on the leash. He's out in the backyard. And we like it when he barks when there's danger. We throw him a bone every once in a while. We go to Christmas and Easter to keep him happy. We've not been close enough in proximity to actually allow it to change our heart, change our life change the environment of our home and our family and what is happening to see the spread of his love move through our home, our household. For some of us, though, this is kind of weird. For some of us, we're actually inoculated to the love of God. Inoculated, it's like a vaccine, right? It's where they put small traces of something into your body, and, and then it, what happens is your body develops an immunity to it, and then you're no longer able to be infected by it. Some of us, I think, mostly in America, what's happened is that since we were a child, we got just small traces of Jesus. Christmas, Easter, here or there. We went to church, slept most of the time, thought it was boring, never really got it. But we got just enough of it to think we got it. And now what's happened is we've been vaccinated from God's love. It's just kind of a religion that's out there that I don't get and I don't really want to bother with it. But if we unleash the lion, what he's going to do is he's going to change the proximity to her life. And where he's going to go, he's going to go to the places that need to be healed in our hearts and our souls. And when we do, we'll begin to operate with unconditional love and connection. Where's God going next? Well, he's going to begin to change our posture for others in our life. Some of us have a contagious problem. We just need to change our proximity and spend more time with Jesus. And guess what? It will begin to be infected by it. Some of us, we say, you know what? I'm not sure that my life would have that kind of impact. And I've not seen that before. Like I invite people to church sometimes, but I've never actually seen my life be a part of this kind of spontaneous growth of, of the faith you're talking about. 
And I think some of that is because as we read the stories in the gospel, I'm going to hit you with a couple stories real quick in the New Testament, is none of these stories have people inviting their friends to a church in their town that has a cool service. Right? What we do now is we do have a cool church. It's very nice. These lights are cool. Let me look at the beams of light. That's really cool, right? And this, this stuff is cool. That's a look at, let's look at the cool logo we made. And so it's cool enough that you'll invite a friend and say, hey, come to my cool church. And if you invite your friend to this cool church, they might meet and unleash God in their life and begin following him. And it would be cool. But there's no way if you just bring your friend and leave them and then don't actually have proximity and and change your posture to their life that they're going to catch what you have. Some of us like that. The reason we like inviting friends to church and not into our life is because we're like, listen, I'm a mess and I don't really want to fix myself. I got God on a chain in the backyard. So go to church. Darren seems to have it figured out. Josh seems to talk pretty well. There's cool lights. But in these stories of of Christianity actually changing the known world, it was people who had actually been infected with the love of God to where, in fact, it it changed everything in their life where they really did begin to operate with unconditional love and connection with other people. As Josh talked about, they had this white hot faith and they had this this, this connection and this, this dedication to the cause. And then their relationships actually became contagious and it changed the world. Because they weren't inviting people to a service to hear a guy talk. They were inviting people into their life to actually get infected with the love that had changed theirs. You say, yeah, Darren, but you don't know my friends. They're really off the radar. And my, my neighbors, especially my family. Like, God's, there's no way God's going to reach my family. Like, I got, we got a mess in my family. I love the story of Cornelius, one of the first people, one of the first households that actually begins to follow Jesus. I'll I'll, I'll chop up the story for you. It's in the book of Acts. There's a man named Cornelius, and he lived in Caesarea, Caesarea, captain of the Italian guard, so he's not a Jew. He was a thoroughly good man. He was a thoroughly good man, and he had led everyone to to his house to to live worshipfully before God. He was always helping people in need, and he had the habit of prayer. And one day about 3 o'clock in the morning in the afternoon, one one day about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision of an angel of God, as real as his next-door neighbor came in and said, Cornelius, Cornelius started wondering if he was seeing things. And then he said, what do you want, sir? The angel said, your prayers and neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. Here's what I want you to do. Send men to Joppa, to Joppa to get Simon, the one who everyone calls Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is down the sea. So Cornelius sends, his, sends uh, for, for Peter. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. He comes to, to, to Cornelius' house. It's odd because at this point, Jews would not operate or, or, or associate with non-Jewish people. So Paul, or Peter is breaking a bunch of rules that he would say, listen, this is way out of my comfort zone. There's no way I'm getting involved in this. There's a whole other story where God sends another angel in a vision to Peter with some sheets and animals. Read it. It's really interesting. And he's like, listen, everybody's in on it. Go talk to Cornelius. So when he gets to Peter, gets to Cornelius' house, he comes in. And he says, I think I'm the man you're looking for. What's up? And a day later, they entered Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them and had his relatives and close friends waiting with him. His whole household is there. What happens is Peter explains to him this unconditional love and connection of God. And in that day, Cornelius and his entire household began following Jesus. There's other stories. There's a story about a lady named Lydia. This is a pretty funny one. And if you unleash the line, he's going to change your purpose. He's going to actually change your proximity to him, but he will change your posture. And he might lead you to places that you're uncomfortable going. It's actually called faith. It's kind of his deal, right? The funny story about this one is Lydia, it says here in in the book of Acts chapter 13, on the Sabbath, this is Paul now, who's going out with with the love of God. He left the city and went down uh, to the river where he had heard that there was a prayer meeting. When we took our place with the women who had gathered there and talked with them, one woman, one woman, Lydia, from Thyatira, was a dealer in expensive textiles, known to be a God-fearing woman. As she listened with intensity to what we said, the master gave her a trusting heart, and she believed. After she was baptized, along with everyone in her household, she said in a surge of hospitality, if you're confident that I am in this with you, and believe, and the master truly has come... and, and you believe in the master truly, come home with me and be my guest. We hesitated, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. Why would Paul and his friends hesitate to go home with Lydia? Well, here's the deal. Lydia 
was in, was, he says she's a dealer in fine textiles, right? So probably the deal with her household, all the people that got infected with the love of God and were baptized that day, all of them were probably models as a part of her high fashion business she had. So Paul and his buddies are there, all these Jewish men, way outside their comfort zone, just talking to these very pretty ladies at the lakeside where they were praying. They all come to faith. They get baptized. I don't like, you guys don't have a place to stay. Come back to our house. And Paul's thinking, if this hits Twitter, I am totally finished. (laughs) Like, This is why I keep God in a chain in the backyard because he's gonna lead me to reach people and talk to people and get way outside my comfort zone. But Paul does it. And from household to household to household, the world changes. I'm out of time, check it out. This isn't the Bible. This is a daily diary from 1973. It's my great grandmother's diary. She wrote every day in her life what was going on. Some days it's, it's not that exciting. Like here's October 23rd of that year, 42 degrees. Uh, she went to a, a race, got no. Oh, she went to the grocery store and got some drugs. She painted the windows in somebody's house. Not that exciting. But I was going through the journal. My mom and her sisters found these and, and I went to September 9th. We find it. September 9th, and it said this, much cooler and some rain, but we had 58 in Sunday school. Not that exciting. Then she says this, Pete, JD, Dave, and Daryl were baptized today in the river near the campgrounds. Those mean, those names mean nothing to you. But when we talk about unleashing the lion and him changing our purpose of our life for unconditional love and connection. We talk about the spread of the gospel going from household to household to household. This is a a record in 1973 of the day that my grandfather and my dad and my uncle were all baptized on the same day. Let me tell you how this worked. My family was somewhat irreligious and it began with my grandma Sylvie. This is her journal. She began following Jesus, not like going to just church and like being there. She genuinely was infected by the unconditional love of God. And here's what happened. It began to spread through my family. So before you know it, my grandmother came to faith and not just went to church and tried to be a good Christian. She genuinely was infected with the unconditional love of God. And he began to heal and change her heart. And guess what? Just a few time after that, my mom comes to faith in Christ. Within the year of my mom coming to faith in Christ, my dad comes to faith in Christ. You say, oh, well, they were probably good people, right? Well, I'm not trying to tell stories of my dad, but he wasn't necessarily the greatest person in the world at this point, okay? He liked to wreck cars and beat people up, and he was a Vietnam vet, and he had not really lived a Christian life because he didn't have a Christian home because his dad was an alcoholic and a farmer, an oil worker. So my dad comes to faith shortly after that, through him actually meeting Jesus and following Jesus and Jesus changing him as his life, my uncle comes to faith and my grandpa comes to faith. And then before you know it, my dad's on his side of the family, his great grandmother comes to faith. And then a few years after that, at 72 years old, he leads his mom and his dad to faith in Jesus Christ. In the last like 20 years of my grandparents' life, I get to see them change the way they actually unconditionally loved people and were connected and more loving and more patient and more kind and more gentle because Jesus was real. It wasn't because they went to church more. It wasn't because they stopped doing all the bad stuff. They literally really did meet Jesus and he changed the purpose of their life for unconditional love and connection. And now, many, many years later, many generations moved. I'm talking about the fact that long time ago, a lady named Sylvia Smith unleashed the lion of God in her life and it has changed my entire family. So here's the deal. If you spent time with Sylvia Smith, guess what you got infected by? The unconditional love of Jesus. Here's the question for you, and we're over time, but it's Saturday night. Here's the deal. You are contagious. You walked in here 
absolutely contagious and from your life is either exuding life or death, love or hate, fear or love. And guess what? It is infecting your whole family. And someday your great grandchild may be standing on a stage or in a street or at someone's couch and they may be telling stories about the day they found your journal. And here's the question. What will they say about you? Tell you about my great grandpa. Tell you about my great grandma. She unleashed the lion of God in her life and it changed her purpose. She literally started to try to live her life unconditionally loving people and staying connected and it changed her whole proximity to Jesus and my world has changed. So as we finish, here's how it's gonna work. I just want you to, to, uh, I want you to think about this and pray during the next two songs because here's the deal. Sometimes at church we say uh, dumb things that deceive you. We ask you to make a prayer, like pray. If you want to have God's unconditional love in your life, just pray this prayer and it'll happen. And guess what? You genuinely, intently pray that prayer because I think you want it and God's stirring in your heart and you want to know that that's what you're infecting your kids with and your grandkids with and the whole neighborhood with. But here's the deal. It doesn't happen that easy. That would be like me telling you, hey, who wants to lose 20 or 30 pounds tomorrow morning? And we all, with great intention, bow our heads and close our eyes and say, Jesus, help me lose 50 pounds. And you wake up tomorrow and guess what? You're not going to weigh any different. And you might go, Jesus doesn't work. No, Jesus works, but there's a thing called a process. It's called being a disciple of Jesus. So if you're here tonight and you say, you know what? That's, I, I, yeah, 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 I, I would like to be contagious with the unconditional love of God. It starts by you saying, Jesus, I, I would like you to, I'd like to unleash you in my heart and I would like you to change the purpose of my life to be actually unconditional love and connection. And during these songs, you can just talk to God in your own time. He's listening. But the second thing you actually do is you begin to change your proximity to Jesus. Does that mean you come to church all the time? I don't know, you figure it out. It means you talk, here's what what you do. Find the person in your life that you think has the closest proximity to God and might be infected with his unconditional love. And then say, hey, can we spend more time together? Because if you're contagious with that love, it might rub off. And as that happens, the third thing will take care of itself. Your posture to other people will change because you'll be motivated by unconditional love and connection.